Certainly the chill had already presented itself in the two upstairs bedrooms of her cottage, and by the ominous blowing of the noontime wind, her mother had instructed her to rouse out the bedstones, that they may have a handsome warming on the stove after dinner. This she had done with great enthusiasm, running up and down the stairs with the objects, the self-same attitude she kept in the accomplishment of all her other chores, the disposal of a few buckets of ash from their old but precious stove, the sweeping and dusting after having done so, and the assistance in light scullery duty nebulous to the cooking, for it was her desire that after they had eaten their dinner she would then be allowed to visit Hedgley's Inn, the plough, which sat just a few steps down from their King Street residence. Indeed, she had begged her dear papa that she may accompany him on his way back to his shop for the afternoon watch, and then see him off after making camp at an out-of-the-way table in front of the inn, in order to watch the goings-on of the place. And it was there, shortly after her father had taken leave of her, that the little watcher did spot a kind, familiar face, Harriet Moore of Woodbridge, a woman some fifteen years her senior, but not unlike her in the qualities of curiosity, quiet observation, and the desire to own every last detail of the world around her and beyond, these two manifesting in the traipsing of the local roads, fields, and for her part, the abundant woodland that separated Woodbridge and Hedgley. To be sure, from such the woman had recently emerged, her walking skirt and petticoat begrimed, with design to visit a small bookshop that was but a few paces removed from where the girl's father kept shop on Hedgley's main street. "'Hello, my dear,' Miss Moore replied to the girl's glowing countenance, ignited upon spotting her striding down the road. Her voice's melodious expression, just a few decibels lower than that of a full-throated bellow, not only cheered her young friend further, but the lass's quick eyes observed that it caused the brief turning of heads attached to young bachelors who had business at the inn. Miss Moore was a woman of great beauty and local renown. Indeed, there was not a man in the county who would deny that she, with her Irish-like black hair and blue eyes, was the most handsome creature against whatever comparison, be it a player of Greek poetry or an ideal representation in the modern trend of picturesque painting, one could gather. "'Hello, Miss Harriet,' she returned, the excitation of her voice edging toward the limit of propriety, while she gave an overly dramatic curtsy. A sudden spell of embarrassment then came upon her as she looked down at her table, and she sullenly confessed, "'Oh, but I have no apple for you today.' "'Quite all right, dear, quite all right.' We must leave the bulk of them to their new owner now, so you needn't feel obliged to satisfy this old gal in the matter, said Miss Moore, and observing still a vestige of sadness in her eyes, she quickly added, Besides, my uncle has a whole congregation of trees out back his place. In fact, some are quite anxious to be relieved of their fruit, as it has grown ripe and heavy, and I will leave a few examples with Mrs. Bagley here at the inn next week, with instruction that should she see you at your table, she would not do wrong in passing them along. At this, the young tailor's daughter felt her heart accelerate, and she began a belting series of gracious words, but such were jaggedly cut short by a distal voice, the tone of which ringing in diametric opposition to her own. From a recently deposited carriage at the plough's front drive, this voice cried, "'Miss Moore! Miss Moore! Which you know I will not be ignored so, after this long ride from London itself, with not a soul there having any notion of turning their nose away from me as I approach, and considering that, where would that put the inhabitants of our quaint settings? The brash voice coming towards their table was that of Mrs. Edwards, the wife of Hedgley's particular Baptist minister, Mr. George Edwards, a big-boned woman in fertile descent with an apparent overindulgence in the bounty of what the Lord and Towns did produce in victuals and hearsay, Jolly would not be the perfect descriptor for her, saving it be preceded by something a tad rash. "'It is holy providence, I find, that you have been placed before me here, that I may address you on a matter I've been intending to call about these many moons. Miss Moore, I have from my parlour window watched you come down this very road— what, five, seven or more years now? Come and go you do at your pleasure, retrieving your pamphlets and books and such from that shabby little corner shop, with not nearly enough occasions where a chaperone was present. And as these years go by, each successive one brings to my ear less and less news of proposals, if I may be so bold aimed in your direction, she lectured, the last part being issued in a notably quieter and secretive tone that strangers about the inn almost needed struggle to hear. Miss Moore's cheeks pinked a tad at this, 
but little if at all did her face change from its naturally pleasant disposition, for she interpreted this as regret from a social slight. Her father, Jonathan Moore, was the Anglican minister for Woodbridge, a position given to him by her uncle George Moore, the local squire and the town's most proficient landowner, and although they were of divergent Christian sects, it was perhaps cruel that the two ministers' families found little time to give support to one another as members of the self-same trade, they being the only two serving their rural towns. "'I am quite sorry that I do not call as often as I should on my ventures, Mrs Edwards. Next week I shall, after I make a small delivery to the inn for my friend here,' Miss Moore returned, motioning toward the girl. This apparently afforded Mrs Edwards much pleasure, though she continued to ignore the shortest member of their improvised party, offering in what jocular tone she could muster, "'A fine idea indeed, Miss Moore, that we may begin at once in finding you a suitable husband. Mayhaps a fine Baptist one that would help us throw you in the river. Oh, I am teasing. We do not throw our chosen into rivers. I am but repeating ripe nonsense from our schoolyard. Oh, ha, ha, ha!' Mrs. Edwards thought herself rather sharp, entertaining that the solution to keeping Miss Moore from her lonesome wanderings about the towns, an obvious problem for a clergyman's family in her opinion, her apparel soiled in faith knows what from Hedgeley and Woodbridge Woods, and surely ruining her reputation secondary to her limited accompaniment, was to marry her off, hopefully to a man who understood the merit of a carriage, but more so, one who possessed a credible understanding of that which bound a woman to her home, her husband and her social duty, and even more hopefully to a right Baptist, that she may secure a liaison with Woodbridge's most prestigious family, even if they were but Anglican. In fact, it was quite probable that an eligible young man had recently come into her social circle, thusly motivating her sudden interest in the matter. "'But surely you would not come quite as soiled as your present venture has you?' "'And certainly with a proper chaperone, for I see you are alone today,' Mrs Edwards further ventured, her voice booming enough that it could well be interpreted that she sought to publicly shame her young friend into her staunch view of propriety. "'Not at all, Mrs Edwards,' replied Miss Moore, as she examined her lower extremity to cloak whatever displeasure she feared might be showing in her eyes at the thought of designed matrimony. The astringent old hen perhaps did not smoke that such a union as she had proposed could very well leave her unrecognised by her family, thusly confounding any diplomatic fantasies she had constructed, not that she herself bore any prejudice against men whose beliefs varied from that of her kin's. As for accompaniment, you may not have noticed, but I have one of the finest walking companions available in Hedgeley at this very table. "'Oh, Faith! The little non-elect squeaker of a thing!' the minister's wife cried with a quick glance at the child, a bit agitated she did at all have to acknowledge the creature. She then proceeded to turn her back toward the table, motioning that Miss Moore might do the same, as she had something of whispered importance to say. "'I'm told she steals apples from her newly shown neighbour, the Mr Winter,' she lightly proposed, then in her heavier voice as if to convey to the little non-elect that she was not the topic of gossip, she continued— not that we are at all impressed with him, either, dressing up an old farmhouse in extravagant pleasure and in a contradictory fashion, running about the town without his person in proper dress. At this very inn we were dining this summer, and from the window yonder we watched the man come down the road from his perch with nothing but old filthy shirt-sleeves intending to dine, whilst a servant ran after him with his waistcoat and jacket. I'm sure the entire inn did watch him publicly dress, before shamelessly sitting amongst them, eating with the manners of common chattel. "'Tolerance, Mrs Edwards, tolerance, my love,' Mr Edwards kindly offered in the baritone voice that matched his tall, grey, near-plump and leathery exterior, as he came within range of the ladies after having settled with their carriage. "'For we are but one set of folk upon this earth out of countless others.' and though across our oceans we do find inferior varieties with which we do our best in their keeping, our own countrymen, regardless of their extremity, shall not be treated any worse than they, and therefore tolerance must be issued. Oh, how do you do, Miss Moore? Respectful nods were made, whilst the table's quietest attendant again sat awkwardly unmentioned, the discomfort of the slight coming solely from the part of Miss Moore, for it was naught to the child to invisibly watch the adults prattle on. Mrs. Edwards then opportunistically took command of the conversation and proceeded to carry on about the testing of Mr. Edwards' own resolve at the Baptist Union meeting in London, which they had just quit that morning. 
the man apparently was an advocate of the influential ministers Fuller and Booth with regard to closed communion. Yet merely five years from the demise of Fuller, and but fourteen from that of Booth's, several other members of the Union were pleased to rattle off passages from the Candidus Pacificus tract. Mr. Edwards certainly did loathe that which was not steeped in reverent tradition, and had found himself sharp-set to get home to his like-minded brethren, who, because of their small country setting with its almost changeless agrarian economy, were shielded from the scourges of rationalism, empiricism, and any other encouragements of excessive thought, which had long devoured England's grandest cities. Thus it was that the couple had broke off their London engagements a day early, and made their way back to Hedgeley directly. Great minutes went by as Miss Moore politely acknowledged this or that, in the inexhaustible prose of the minister's wife, as she issued a flight of thoughts along many a subject, the union's internal strife, and how cavalier the newer members were at molesting orthodoxy for the sake of growing a following, Mr. Winter's horrid glass shed of a thing that spoiled his backyard, and how poor the cooking had been at the inn recently, and the demise of servitude in general. But as she started to pontificate on French and German inferiority, Mr. Edwards thankfully stepped in, noticing that the slight pink in Miss Moore's cheeks began to smoulder. "'And how does your father come along, Miss Moore? According to your country Anglican, he should be back at Woodbridge within the month,' the preacher interjected. "'Thank you. He is quite well, and it is as Uncle reports. He will be back shortly, were the roads at all to cooperate," she graciously returned. "'Edinburgh is such a stretch removed, as is his surely unhappy tenure. We are astonished that it has taken this long to settle his poor brother's accounts. God love him. And though we regret the interval and circumstance, we will be heartily glad to have him back. His congregation, too, must share the feeling, for during the time we have gotten at our Sunday doors a few lost fellows from his flock, no doubt uninspired by the walk up Westfield Road. We always take them in, but are mindful that they are certainly missed in Woodbridge.' "'Certainly they are, Mr. Edwards, but it is quite understandable. "'Father's ways are hardly replaceable, "'and I believe I have some authority on the matter of the road "'and can sympathise with any that have toiled six days in their fields "'and are expectant a day of rest on the seventh. "'It had been almost fifty days of rest since Jonathan Moore had quit Woodbridge, "'initially with his entire family, "'they all having travelled to Edinburgh to attend the mortal rites of his younger brother Charles,' a natural philosopher and professor at the university who had unexpectedly died on a naturalistic expedition. And though the family had returned after several weeks of social calls to local relatives and close friends from Edinburgh's Royal Society, Mr Moore had stayed behind to reconcile financial matters, he being his brother's executor, as there were no male heirs to his modest purse, his production limited to but a lonesome daughter. However, long after annuities were written, debts settled and the like, Mr. Moore stayed on in his brother's Northumberland Street apartments. Social calls had led to friendships, and those, catalyzed and fed by the desire to understand his brother's view of the world with regard to natural philosophy, had led to dedicated study. This was by no means a secretive affair, but nor was it documented in the country Anglican or published mouth to ear by those of intimate connection with the parson. Indeed, Miss Moore thought little of it, for her father had very much adored his sibling, the man being but four years his junior. Dedicating a year toward understanding him in the deepest manner with the fullest of appreciation seemed only right and natural, and who was she to instruct any man, none the less her father the parson, on propriety concerning grieving? Mrs. Edwards again piped up, the junior Mr. Moore must have been a man of extensive property, that a year's time was necessary to conclude his business. I was just telling Mr. Edwards after he had seen the announcement in the Anglican that a clerk or a lawyer should have served proxy to most of it. Let the poor man have come home ages ago, I said, even if it meant a bushel of letters from there and back. Miss Moore, fearful that the preacher's wife may pull hard on the reins of the conversation once again, and desiring not to walk her return route, Westfield Road, in anything but the crispest light as it owned a credible stride through the darkened wood, unhesitatingly replied, "'Thank you, Mrs. Edwards, but I believe the business has been quit for some time now. Father, wishing to celebrate his brother, has made close acquaintances with those members of the Royal Society that had called my uncle their friend. 
he was too a member and a professor of natural history and philosophy at the university. Natural history! Mrs Edwards started at the revelation, in a tone anticipating a disapproving sentiment. Miss Moore, determined not to encourage her forward, hastily returned. Yes, Mum, he has become enraptured with my uncle's personal library, as well as that of the universities, in regard to the subjects he was expert on, and the society members have kindly guided him through it all, he reports. In fact, we knew he was perfectly serious on quitting the town when trunks of books and manuscripts started to present at Woodbridge Manor with arrangements that they would be incorporated into our own library there. Miss Moore, observing that Mrs Edwards was momentarily confounded with the notion that a country clergyman would so extensively embrace subjects of a worldly origin, as if history did show such a thing to be anything but regular, made her excuses that she must be on her way on account of the fickle sunlight, promising again to call the next week. And the preacher and his wife curiously put little resistance up against her declination of the use of their carriage, she dare not spoil such a fine thing with her muddy boots. All the while, the patient girl from her table watched Mr Edward's face in reaction to the news of his colleague's newly found interests. Though there was still a wealth of kindness, a slight trouble had begun to present to its surface, which involved a downward and pursed tension in his lips, and the augmentation of the crevices upon his weathered forehead. These features were indeed quite minuscule, so much so that it was the girl alone who perceived them, the silent having the greatest understanding of the dynamics of silence. <laughs>